This is Dr. Howard Strassler presenting the e-lecture Anterior Aesthetic Preparations and Restorations, Module C, the Class 4. The goal of aesthetic treatment is to create and place an invisible restoration. Uh, if you look at this traumatic fracture on number 9, on the distal incisal edge, uh, and then the tooth being restored, you can see that very, uh, very few people would notice that anything had happened uh, to this patient, that it's invisible uh, when the patient's speaking and functioning. When we're making decisions for the class 4 restoration uh, of a fractured tooth, uh, when the enamel fracture is very small, we can smooth it with discs and rubber abrasives. As we can see, this is a very small enamel fracture, and all we need is enamel contouring. Uh, for the larger enamel or enamel dentin fracture, uh, our choice for restoration would be with an adhesive direct composite resin. In some cases, the caries may extend from a class 3 or a class 4, a class 3 carious lesion uh, then includes the incisal edge and it becomes a class 4. Uh, in this case, where we're looking at a radiograph, the uh, mesial surface of number 8 was carious, and by the time we prepare it, the thin spicule of enamel uh, will be lost and it will become a class 4 preparation. Let's talk about tooth enamel contouring, uh, the class 4 uh, traumatic fracture. Uh, for this patient who's unhappy with their smile, they have a, a small chip of the incisal edge, uh, and the chip may be due to uh, a fracture that was traumatic, or it may be chipping due to attrition or wear. Uh, we need to evaluate the occlusion and see how the occlusion is going to impact upon our treatment. We can use discs from coarse to medium discs to contour the enamel. We can use finishing burrs and finishing diamonds to contour the enamel uh, and then polish it with rubber abrasives. Uh, the patient's going to be part of the decision making. In fact, you'll demonstrate to them what you're planning to do and give them a mirror so they can help guide you as you go step by step. The thickness of the enamel, the position of the tooth will all be limiting factors in how far we can reshape and contour and polish a tooth. Uh, for this patient, there was traumatic chipping of number 8 and 9, uh, and there's a misalignment of uh, number 23 to 25 that the patient also is unhappy with. Uh, part of the treatment plan for this patient for the lower uh, is that uh, to straighten up those misaligned teeth, the crowding, uh, orthodontics is appropriate. The patient uh, tells us that they've had orthodontics in the past and it didn't work. Uh, uh, not wearing a retainer, not having a fixed retainer contributed to that. Uh, so we presented to the patient uh, the concept of doing tooth shaping and contouring uh, and we showed him the areas where uh, we would do those parts of the procedure. Uh, the instrumentation for reshaping and contouring is finishing burrs, uh, finishing diamonds, fine diamonds, uh, using our soft flex discs to reshape, and then a final polish using uh, rubberized porcelain polishing points. Uh, we point out to the patient the areas that we'd like to reshape. Uh, we point out to them that we, we're not going to shorten the teeth, uh, but in fact we're going to bring number 8 in line with number 9. We point to the chipping and the fact that there's no incisal embrasure between 8 and 9, and that the distal of number 8 is longer than the mesial of number 8. We also show them that uh, there's a length discrepancy and a slightly longer distal on number 7 that we can reshape. And so our treatment plan is to reshape the distal of number 8, the distal of number 7, and recreate the incisal embrasure that be shape between number 8 and 9. We're, we're not going to shorten those incisors. So we use a, an XT coarse disc to reshape the distal of number 8 and create the incisal embrasure between number 8 and 9. We've already smoothed down the rough incisal edges 
on the mesial of number 9 and the incisal edge of number 8. We also are reshaping, very gently, the distal of number 7. When we look to the left, we can see how the patient originally presented themselves. And then after some minor reshaping, uh, we've uh, established number 7 as being in alignment with number uh, 10 and, and number 8, 9. We've shortened and reshaped the distal of number 8, but we didn't shorten number 8 and 9 so that it's uh, uh, unesthetic and, and that they're shorter. And we recreated the incisal embrasure between number 8 and 9. Uh, the procedure code for this procedure is a limited occlusal adjustment. Uh, for number uh, for number 23 through number 20, uh, 20, uh, uh, 6, uh, we spoke to the patient about the fact that orthodontics was the treatment of choice. They want to know if something else could be done. And we talked about creating the illusion that the teeth would be straighter. Uh, we need to shorten very slightly and round the mesial and sizal edge of 26. We'd reshape the facial distal of number 25. And we'd also uh, minimize the overlap as best we could and straighten up the distal of number 25. 24, we'd smooth the incisal edge. Uh, and we'd create a little bit of an incisal embrasure between uh, 23 and 24. Using the same discs, we in fact do that. Uh, and the slight uh, bit of reshaping we do is enough to satisfy the patient uh, with the result that we got. And we look at how we've changed this person's smile with a very mild, um, minimally invasive procedure. Uh, and that the code, once again, is a limited occlusal adjustment to change this person's appearance. But what about when there's a traumatic fracture and there's a significant loss of tooth structure? Uh, this patient, this person, was riding a bicycle and an automobile failed to yield the right of way. Person went over the handlebars and, and fractured number nine. The distal and sizal facial link will for surface uh, preparation and restoration. The patient couldn't find the tooth segment, and there was a lacerated uh, part of their lip uh, opposite number nine. Well, for the evaluation of number nine, and the patient couldn't find the tooth segment, is we make radiographs maxillary and mandibular. We check for root fractures. We check for the tooth fragment. Uh, we do percussion, palpation, and vitality testing for all the anterior teeth from 6 to 11, from 22 to 27. And we make a note. We're going to have this patient back to evaluate the, the pulpal status of all those teeth later. We palpate the lip uh, to see if there's any uh, tooth segment there. Uh, and it's too uh, soon after the accident to evaluate the pulpal status, but we do pulp testing cold and EPT uh, to evaluate uh, and create a baseline. We won't know for at least six or eight weeks uh, whether anything's going to happen, and endodontic treatment may not be necessary until perhaps years to come. On the radiograph, we may notice an obliteration and narrowing of the root canal for any of those anterior teeth, and that's why we're going to make uh, periapical uh, radiographs for this patient. One of the things that can sometimes happen when there's a traumatic injury, with or without a fracture, uh, and the tooth may not need endodontic treatment, is that the tooth may become discolored. You can see the discoloration in this uh, traumatic events to uh, the central incisors for both of these patients. There was no need for endodontic treatment, but radiographically there was an obliteration, a narrowing of the root canal. The teeth that don't fracture many times are the ones that have endodontic staining, where the pulp actually is bruised and bleeds into the dentinal tubules. The discoloration is due to the hemosiderin products that are within the tubules and then uh, deteriorate and change the color to this orange-yellow uh, opaque appearance. So let's look at this patient who 
uh, had a bicycling accident. We're going to evaluate number nine. And these are things I want to talk to the patient about because the treatment that I present in the treatment plan will include the possibility that these teeth may need endodontic treatment in the future. This tooth may need a crown in the future. In fact, uh, if there's a, a, a lawsuit involved that the attorney needs to understand all those aspects, and you may need to write a letter of consultation. And when you do that, you charge the lawyers a fee for your expertise and for this consultation letter for the expected future potential treatment uh, for these teeth. So what do you notice about number nine? Look at number nine very carefully. And look at it from an aesthetic standpoint. Color, shape, size, dimensions. Well, do you notice the distal diastema with number 10? It's been there for a while. Uh, can we narrow it? Can we remove it completely? Uh, number 9 is, in fact, wider than number 8, so that to close that diastema uh, may, in fact, make number 9 look wider. Although midlines is usually more of the issue than tooth width that patients see and are able to evaluate. As for any composite before applying the dental dam or tooth preparation, we select the tooth shade. Uh, the tooth shade is going to be based upon the color of the area being restored, and we're restoring the incisal two-thirds of number nine. We use a Vita shade guide uh, to do that evaluation. Uh, the dental dam is going to be applied, and we're going to smooth any roughened areas of the tooth. Any sharp angled areas need to be removed. Our preparation designed for the class four uh, is an intra-enamel chamfer. 1 to 2 millimeters long, half the thickness of the enamel. It could have been a long bevel as well. The length of the chamfer, as I said, is 1 to 2 millimeters long. And take your periodontal probe and evaluate the length of that chamfer, uh, preparing it with a chamfer diamond. We'll prepare it on the facial and lingual surfaces to make sure we have adequate thickness of composite. Uh, all the tooth surfaces are etched enamel and dentin for 15 seconds simultaneously, and we always etch slightly beyond the preparation margins. We rinse the tooth off with an air water spray or a water stream for 10 seconds, and we dry, leaving the enamel dry. The enamel will have a frosty appearance to it, and you can see we're slightly beyond the cava surface margins. Uh, the dentin uh, for this case, can be dry because it's such a small dentinal surface, and our primary retentive structure is the enamel. If we're going to moisten the dentin, we're going to gently moisten it uh, so there's no visible water and that it's just glossy in appearance. The adhesives that we use at the University of Maryland are either the fourth generation Scotch Bond Multipurpose or the fifth generation Optibond Solo Plus. Class 4s should never be restored with self-etch adhesives unless you're etching the enamel before using a self-etch adhesive. The fourth generation Scotch Bond Multipurpose uh, contains in its primer organic solvent and a hydrophilic monomer HEMA hydroxyethyl methacrylate. The adhesive uh, third bottle of the fourth generation adhesive has a bis-GMA hydrophobic resin combined with a hydrophilic monomer HEMA. Uh, and that would be our Scotch Bond multipurpose. Our single component adhesive, our Optibond Solo Plus, has the primer adhesive in one bottle, which contains our organic solvent, uh, in this case an alcohol, a hydrophilic monomer HEMA, and a bis-GMA resin plus a very small amount of water. And these are the adhesives that we use at the University of Maryland. Scotch Bond Multipurpose and Optibond Solo Plus. Uh, the purpose of the adhesive is to seal the tooth restorative interface, decrease leakage at the tooth restorative interface, uh, and enhance restoration retention by mechanical locking of the adhesive to the roughened surface. Uh, we'll be bonding to both the etched enamel and the etched dentin, but enamel is our primary retentive structure and substance uh, for class 4 restorations. 
For this case, we use a fifth generation adhesive Scotch bond multipurpose. We apply the hydrophilic primer uh, to the enamel and the dentin for five seconds, agitated it, and then air dried. We then applied our adhesive uh, to the enamel, etched enamel, and etched dentin surface after the primer. We air thinned it, and then we white cured it on the facial and the lingual. For this case, we didn't need a clear mylar strip because there was a space between the distal of number 9 and the mesial of number 10. For most class 4s, we'll be using a mylar matrix strip. When we use a mylar, or for any composite for a class 4, the lighter the shade, the less curing time. We can get away with 20 seconds on the facial and 20 seconds on the wing wool for a light that has 1,000 milliwatts per centimeter squared. Uh, that's the energy that we'll need in order to white cure. Uh, the darker shades and the bleaching shades require more curing time, 30 seconds on the facial, 30 seconds on the wing wool, making sure the white tip uh, encompasses the entire surface that's being light cured. There'll be more on that uh, in the section on light curing that uh, you'll have as an e-lecture. And so our primer was applied for five seconds. Our adhesive was applied air thinned and light cured. The adhesive slight cured for 10 seconds on the facial, 10 seconds on the lingual. The composite slight cured uh, uh, for 20 to 30 seconds. When you light cure the adhesive, it'll be wet. Leave it wet. That's the air inhibited, the oxygen inhibited layer. It allows us to have a better bond between the composite interface and the adhesive interface. I've light cured the adhesive, now applied my composite. I can apply it in one increment or multiple increments, layering it. Uh, I don't need to layer, but I can layer because it may be more convenient for light for sculpting. Here I'm using a light shade composite, and I'm light curing 20 seconds on the wing, 20 seconds on the facial. As close to the pre preparation restoration as possible. Uh, at right angles to that, those surfaces that I'm light curing. Uh, once I've light cured, I can then marginate the restoration here in the lower right hand side. I can see an ET burr using to marginate. I can use finishing burrs, finishing diamonds, discs to shape uh, our composite, seating our patient up to uh, adjust and adapt the uh, and size the ledge, and then a final polish with uh, our enhanced polisher followed by our composite polishing paste on a Profi cup or our super fine soft flex disc. Between each grid as we're finishing and polishing the composite, we're going to wipe it off with a cotton roll wetted with water. If there's interproximal contact, our gingival margin will be uh, shaped with a Bard Parker disposable scalpel blade to remove any excess and a, uh, an interproximal gapped finishing strip. After removing the dental dam, we'll check occlusion and centric occlusion and through all excursive movements, making any adjustments uh, as is necessary. The goal of aesthetic treatment when restoring class 4s, any aesthetic restoration, is an invisible restoration that only the dentist and the patient knows that something's been done to restore that tooth. And the challenge of aesthetic restorations in the aesthetic zone uh, requires attention to detail in all aspects from diagnosis to preparation and then restoration. The patient must be pleased with the final result. Uh, of the restoration and you should tell them during the treatment plan as to what the limitations may be. For this year, adolescent who fractured their central incisor, number eight, mesial incisal, uh, the restoration was invisible to all that saw it. All they saw was that he had a, a good looking smile. You've been listening to and watching Anterior Aesthetic Preparations and Restorations, uh, Module C, uh, the class four.